When it comes to winning on football's biggest stage, my guest tonight has few equals. After starting his illustrious career at Louisiana Tech University, Terry Paxton Bradshaw became the first overall pick in the 1970 NFL Draft. He would go on to lead the Pittsburgh Steelers to four Super Bowl titles in six years, win two Super Bowl MVP awards, and was named to the 1970s All-Decade Team. But before he became a first ballot Hall of Famer, did you know he nearly lost his arm to gangrene as a kid? Set a national javelin record in 1966 and played his entire career with undiagnosed attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Well, tonight we'll learn what makes this undeniable icon who he is. A man who once said, the only way to shut everybody up is to win. Please welcome the first NFL player to have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Terry Bradshaw. Thank you. My right or left. Thank you very much. Just me here. That's you. Hi, folks. Thank you. Oh, very nice. Finally, I'm out here. The introduction too long? Was you no, no, back was, there stewing? You didn't, no, you, you, you were fine. But I, I was telling Joe earlier today, I said, I've been wanting to come on this show, but then I got to thinking of all the great people you've had out here. Maybe I don't quite measure up anymore, so I had my feelings hurt a little. Well, four yeah. people canceled. <laughs> hey, talk to me. 1948, born in Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah. Second of three boys. And life there was, I think, the reason why you were so tough in the NFL. I mean, tell me about your childhood. I, well, I, it, I don't necessarily agree with that, Joe. Um, my life was, you know, I told my mother one time, I said, we grew up poor, but I didn't, she didn't want to hear that. So we were lower middle class. Eh, that didn't quite work either. Right. We were middle class, but we really were. To my estimation, when I look back on it, we, we were struggling. Three, you know, three kids and a little bit. But you don't house. know it when you're in it, right? Didn't know I was poor. The kids started making fun of me. Didn't know that uh, when I had patches on my knees that that's a sign of being poor, I guess. And, and people make fun, the kids would make fun of you. And then you're, you're starting to question you. But never, never, never certainly lacked for food or shelter or clothing. Tons of love uh, as a kid. Grew up... Uh, Spent most of my childhood, my happiest moments in my childhood were at my grandfather's farm because uh, he was a watermelon and a cotton farmer and uh, he had the Clydesdale horses and that was my association with horses. I was the chicken kid because I was quick and I could run the chicken down after <laughs> church. And uh, what did you do with the chicken? That was we killed it. <laughs> what do you think? You think I ran it down for fun? No, no. <laughs> Pretty bird. Well, actually, pretty, pretty, pretty bird. Actually, I do have Rhode Island Reds at home. And this, and this morning, flying out, he was sitting in my driver's seat of my truck. I've got 17 of them, and they're really kids. And right. so it would be hard to, his name is One-Eyed Jack, and it'd be hard. You know, <laughs> not <laughs> one eye. <laughs> Tell me about your dad, Bill, a welder, hardworking yeah. guy, hard discipline guy. He was... And he, my mother did the beatings or whippings. Right. Uh, and my dad was uh, uh, put himself through college. He, had, he needed three hours to graduate with an engineering degree, went at night. What did you learn from him? My dad hates lying. And I think that's one of the things today I hate more than anything is lying, people that lie. And Mr. Robinson, my next door neighbor, I borrowed his Wilson or his Spalding glove. I mean, I couldn't afford a Spalding glove, and this thing was like a $22 glove. So back in the 50s, ha, that's a lot of money. And I borrowed that glove to go to baseball practice, and I was just so proud of it. And I slipped it up on my bicycle, and by the time I got home, it was gone. I tracked back and forth, back and forth. I went everywhere looking for that glove. Couldn't find it. Now, two, two, th two days maybe, three, I can't remember, Mr. Robinson said, Bill, my dad, would you tell Terry I, I need my glove for base, baseball games? My dad said, Terry, Mr. Robinson needs a glove. He's got his glove in there. And I went, yeah, it's in the closet, Dad. 
I'm in the closet, and I'm like, oh, Lord, please, Lord, God in heaven, take me now. Right. And I'm in there, and I, I'm seriously looking. Because you, know you never know. The, well, Never. you never know when the miracle is coming. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I'm dead. I'm like, let me, you know, let it show up. <laughs> Next thing I know, my dad has a hold of my arm, and he starts whipping me, which ended up being a beating. I, I never lied to my dad again. I can promise you that. I mean, it got my attention big time. I do want to know more about your mom, though, because I'm fascinated. Novice about, yeah. Genoa. Novice Genoa Bradshaw. Bradshaw, maiden name Gay. Novice Genoa Gay. And she was tough. She was tough. The love of her family is, has no measure. Her family is everything to her. When I grew up, I walked home from school every day of my life, except when I got in high school, for lunch. My mother made breakfast. My mother made lunch. My mother made dinner. My mother cleaned house and did all of it. And there was, on, there was great honor in that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, skinny, 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 beautiful woman. Um, and she's 87 now, still living. My father passed away two years ago. Yeah. Um, and um, a disciplinarian by far, um, a good woman, you know, she cooked. She was housewife and uh, just a great, great woman. Loved her boys. Loved, loved her boys. But I'm always making fun of her. I'm always telling her it's good to have her out. She, the warden let her out for the weekend. <laughs> Stuff like that. She and, hears and, that and she stuff. goes to church, and there's 39 old blue haired hens in that church. Right. And all I'm, I can't believe Terry said that about you, novice <laughs> on TV. And she goes, oh, <laughs> she loves it. Now, if I didn't do it, she'd get her feelings hurt. You know? Right. You didn't talk about me, but yeah. One more thing about your mom. When you talk about your mom was kind of the disciplinarian, your dad acted like it, but your mom kind of, and I say that because I know you got in trouble one time, and your dad <laughs> gave you the option of. Oh. You can either take a beating <laughs> and watch the NFL championship, or you can just go to your room and not watch the NFL championship. Right. And you said, I'll take the beating. I want to watch the football game. Right. But your dad had to act like he, he was beat beating me. you. He beat the so bed. So your mom heard it. Huh? Oh, yeah. My mother heard it. And I, I probably went a little too far. You know, you know oh, Dad, I'll do it again. Oh, Dad, oh, Dad please stop. I'm sure. I I'm sure I went over the top, but my dad, <laughs> my dad was so proud of me. Were you two laughing in there a little bit? No, 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 I wasn't laughing okay, because right. I, I mean, reality could have set in any minute. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <Right. laughs> you went fishing one time and got gangrene, your brother told me? I had split that finger right there and threw the other deal by taking my pocket knife and trying to jab a hole in a Dr. Pepper. And it was sticking, but it wasn't. And then I went and it missed it, and I drove a hole all the way through right here. So I closed my hand like this because we were going to Crystal Lake on a picnic, and I did not want to miss that. And I kept my finger closed just like that so nobody could see the blood and had the picnic and swam and then went home. And I was chasing guppies up and, up and down a sewage ditch and then woke up one night screaming. And you couldn't even see my fingers or this hand. And I had a red line. It was up past my elbow, and I ended up in some kind of vaporizer thing for a couple of weeks. I was always hurt. I broke my collarbone. Twice. Twice. Uh, kicked by horses. I got drug a half a mile by a horse. Well, why did you disagree with me when you sat down and I said the way you grew up made you tough? I mean, come on. Well, that's, that's not necessarily. I'm a complete wimp. That's not, that's not being tough. The hell it isn't that's being, being tough. That's being stupid. When were you first introduced to football? What, what was it that, I know you were a baseball pitcher, pitcher. but the ADD, ADHD was yeah, not so, good with that. Yeah, I was on third base one day, just daydreaming. <laughs> and a guy was on second and stole, th stole third. And that ball hit me right in the face. They pulled me out right in the middle of the game. And 
I never played baseball again. Okay, so <laughs> that's so football. A little slow for me. <laughs> Football's your thing. Um, when I lived in Iowa, we would go to Clinton, and I would walk by the sporting goods store, and they'd have all the black and gold from Iowa Hawkeyes. And they had, I know, and, yeah, then Ron, yeah. and they had the, the footballs would be lined up, and all I could think, and I loved the Iowa Hawkeyes. And I, and I just said, you know, I really would like a football for Christmas. And boy, when I got it, it was just, it was love at first, I mean, it was love at first sight. And I remember, like, when you know you're calling in life, because I told my dad when I was seven, I'm going to play in the NFL. Okay, wait a minute now. What? That's what these shows are all about. You told your dad. Right. When you were seven. You didn't I'm ask me that question. Well. <laughs> I told my dad when I was seven that I was going to play in the NFL. And, of course, great. Yeah. Brush it off. It makes no sense. You couldn't get enough, right? No. Threw it on the Threw it on the top of the house, played games with it bouncing, threw it on top of trees, played games with it bouncing, threw it to make it bounce back. I... I had a fascination with the football. Talking about, I mean, junior high school, they literally told you no. No. Well, uh, you didn't try out. You sat in the bleachers, and the coach would give this Lombardi talk. And I'm just, like, sitting on the edge of my chair. And I'm like, man, this is the way it's supposed to be right here. Listen, God, we won't commit much. Yeah, commit. We're going to sacrifice, and we're going to work hard. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't stand myself. I'm hearing a real live speech, man. It's like a sermon. Oh, I'm sucking it in. And then he says, we're going to pick our team now. What? You're going to pick it? So I got both hands up in the air, and I'm standing up, and I'm waving my hand. And he picked. He picked this team. Picked it. Just sitting there? Sitting there. He picked the team. And so I didn't get, I didn't get, I didn't get a uniform. So I, thank you. <laughs> so in the eighth grade, we go to Oak Terrace. So now, you know, this is where I'm going to shine. Same thing. Meet after school in the gymnasium. I'm going, oh, no. I go sit in the bleachers. Here he comes this guy, gives his speech. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not as excited now. <laughs> then... Doesn't been through this. But he said, the only reason that some of you didn't get a uniform is that we don't have enough. And if someone gets hurt and can't play, then first come, first serve for the... Someone got hurt. And I beat it down there and got a uniform. My first uniform. And I played tackle. And then when they saw me throwing the football. Over on the side, right? Yes, absolutely on the side. And when they saw me throwing the football, that's when they put me at quarterback. Yeah, the coach was like, how did I miss this? Yeah, well, you You're picked over there. me. I didn't try out, and right. you picked me. <laughs> but I, couldn't, I could not take a snap and take a dive, take a snap and hand the ball off, off tackle with a dive. They beat me every time. So that's how uncoordinated. You couldn't get there. I couldn't get there. To hand it off. And then, from the ninth grade, when I got out, I go to Woodlawn High School, which is a relatively new school in Shreveport. I sat on the, a bench behind Trey Prather, Parade All-American for two years. What did football do for you? Did that, did that kind of calm? Frustrated me. <laughs> well, yeah. But, I mean, in a practical way, did that kind of calm you down, the, the ADHD? Did it give you a, a way to vent and, and a way to kind of focus? You know what, Joe? It, I wasn't playing, so it was, um, it was like, don't they know my heart here, how much I love this? And so I, my, I was hurt more than anything, and then I didn't understand my limitations as a gangly kid and you know you can't walk real good i mean that was i was growing up and then my senior year ended up starting quarterback and how fast did that come for you then once you got the chance you had a great senior year it was everything it was everything i i hoped it would be and much more than i could have ever imagined because to ride in that bus and to hear that band playing 
and to pull up to that stadium and to get out with your uniform on and you're the starting quarterback in front of 19,000. I mean, this this is big time. Big high time football. Yeah, we were 3A, which would be 5A now in in the state. Was it was just a it was overwhelming, and to to gather my anxiety and everything so I could, could breathe because the first time I couldn't breathe. It was just like uh, if I could die right now, this is the greatest thing in the world. And then to throw that first that first touchdown pass as a starting. Starting quarterback. At, oh, this whole time you're throwing the javelin and you're setting records and to the point where right. they're having to extend the area <laughs> because you're throwing it so damn far. I was a national record holder. Look at you. I mean, you're, you're put together back then. <laughs> I don't want to brag, Joe. But... <laughs> <laughs> were you? Uh, I talked to your brother just to verify it. I mean, you were offered... Like 200 track scholarships. I was all over the world, actually. And um, were you good enough for the 68 Olympics? I passed on the trials. Yeah. You could have. Yes. Right. Why? There's Why? no money. There's no money. In <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think. I didn't you think. Don't, <laughs> you don't want to catch the pro no. javelin league yeah. uh, later? I didn't. <laughs> yeah. I didn't think I had that enough throwing that javelin. That's uh, quite a strain on your arm. As a matter of fact, they didn't allow my national record to be qualified for the state record. A.O. Williams comes to me and he says, look, they're not going to acknowledge your, your national record. I went, what do you mean? He says, well, you, didn't throw, you got to throw it in the state meet. Well, okay. What's the state record? It was like 202 feet. I warm up at 210. <laughs> so I knew I was going to break the record. So I go down to Northwestern State College where the, nat, where the state meet was, and I warm up, <clears throat> and it's my throw, and I throw 239-something on the first throw. And so I just, I just got- A mic drop and just, just walk out? I just, I just went down there kind of arrogantly and <laughs> got it, put it back in its sleeve, put it in my metal bucket, screwed the lid on it, waved goodbye to all you boys. I went and sat up in the bleachers with my coach and watched these guys try to break it, which nobody came close to. And I threw it one time and got the record and it still stands. Oh my God, that's great. <laughs> Okay, so who taught you your grip? Well, the grip changed. My grip is so wrong. I don't even, and now, if I throw the football, I throw it properly, you know. You don't put your finger down? Mm -mm, No. Well, tell them how you. I started, I threw with the point of my finger on the end of the football. And the reason was, when you throw the javelin, you grip the javelin like this. And when I got the football in my hand, I couldn't get the finger back down. It always went up to the point, and I'd try to put it down on the football the correct way, and it would always work <laughs> back up to the point. And so I said, well, let's figure this out. And then after a while, I got to, well, hey, this is pretty cool because you can, you can make that sucker really spin. Now, you can throw some ugly passes, too, because you're right up on top. But that, the javelin was the reason I gripped the football the way I did. If you got 200 track scholarships... Who was interested in you as a football player coming out of high school? Well, I maybe had 12, 15, 12, not many. You end up at Louisiana Tech. Right. Well, I end up at Tech because I, I signed with LSU, but I flunked the ACT test. Intentionally? Well, it was not a great effort. <laughs> you didn't really want to go there, did you? No, no, I was, why, I felt why a lot Louisiana of pressure. Tech and- pressure. Just a lot of pressure. I went down there, and it just, it just you know how it is? It's kind of like you just want to be part of something that's got a rich tradition, and it's big time. But I wasn't, I, I wasn't ready for the big time. So you were being realistic with what you were prepared for coming out of high school, or right. did you just literally not want the pressure of going to LSU and succeeding? Didn't want the pressure. Um I'm a mama's boy, <laughs> and uh, my mama could come see me over at Ruston. And your brother was there? My brother was there, and they came after me hard and been after me hard for a long time. I also know that for as nice as you are and for as tough as you are, you don't like confrontation either. You could have told LSU no thanks, right? Yep. Yep. But instead, you just flunked the ACT yep. to kind of backward 
back end your way to Louisiana it's Tech. Just the, it's just my thinking was when they made me take the ACT test. If I pass this thing, I'm going to go to you know now I've got to go to LSU. And I knew in my heart I was never wanted. I never wanted to go to LSU. You go to Louisiana Tech, and you're a backup. And you're imagine a, that. And yeah, as great a player as I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Robertson. <laughs> he's, Duck Dynasty. He, he is the. That's him. That's him. <laughs> the Duck Dynasty patriarch is, there he is. is the first string quarterback, and you're backing him up. Yep. You said I, he came straight out of the woods to practice. And on game day, it was like he was mad we had to play a game because the ducks were flying high or the deer were. It was crazy. Hey, he, 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 he nicknamed Blonde Bomber. He Blonde Bomber. I tell you now, hey, 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 hey. Them ducks. <laughs> hey, hey, them ducks is, mm, I'm tell you, them ducks are flying, boy. Them ducks is out there. And I said, we got a game. <laughs> He's the starter. And so. I couldn't beat this guy out. He must have been he good. He was good. He was. He played Alabama the year they won the national title. We played him in Birmingham, and he just lit him up. I started a little bit my sophomore year, but you know, in and out, in and out. Play wonder, well, not play well. He bench income, income still. Phil play not well. In go Terry. Was the time kind of learning what you needed though? You were Joe, raw. It was. It was so. Frustrating for me. Why can't I get this? Why can't I? Why? Why am I not exceptional? Why am I not blowing this out of the park? What is? What is? Is my dream? Is it? Is it going? Is it going south on me? Have I? Have I overstated myself? I can't believe I'm not starting. I can't believe I'm not good. As much as I wanted to be good, I'm not good, and it it drove me crazy. Drove me crazy that I couldn't get I couldn't get a handle on it, and then junior year, everything. My junior year, Phil Phil quit the team, and uh, I got to start. And uh, that junior year I was a small college All American. So, but my but everything came together. You know? Yeah, did I you? went there. I went to Tech at six one. 189, and my junior year, I was 6'3", 212. And so well, everything came together. And by the time you're a senior, you're having really great success. Yep. And your fear of expectation or pressure leads you eventually to the number one overall pick by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh -huh. I mean, there really isn't pressure like that. In your, in, that you could face anywhere else in your life is you're the number one pick. There's <laughs> out there two teams that both finished 1-13 and 13 the previous year, the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Chicago Bears, and they flip a coin, and it was the Pittsburgh Steelers who got the first pick, and they took you. Right. That, right. Well, thank you. Were, you. were you happy to be a Steeler? No, no, please. <laughs> I mean, they were you hear, you hear how I talk? Yeah. <laughs> you think this, this is going to work in Pittsburgh? My social maturity was waning. Uh, no dealing with the press whatsoever. Didn't know how to do that. Didn't do that in college. You're booed your first game. You, go, you cry after the game. It's horrible. It's, it's not anything that I was prepared to handle. Plus, I was away from home. And, uh, and I, I don't want to disappoint people, you know, doing this interview. I, I want this to be a good interview. I don't want to disappoint. You've done that. I don't want to disappoint the people. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I felt a responsibility to, I didn't ask to be the first pick and didn't think that was ever going to be a, a, um, a probability, as it turned out, I was. But I just had Joe. I just had to grow up, and I had a tough coach, which was made it difficult for me because I came out of college and high school being embraced and encouraged and loved. Then I went into this, you know, you know, this tough dude, and I didn't like it at all. I didn't like, and you know, and uh, 
But, but you're, it was hard, real hard. Six touchdowns, 24 picks the first year. Yeah, uh, it was just brutal. It got better. Yeah. And so do you sense at all that – that, okay, I mean, you've been a part of a winning team. Do you see the pieces that are there that you can think, okay, we got a shot now? Yeah, when they got rid of our, – our, our team early in my career was made of a, basically castaways. And then they started drafting. In comes Kolb. Kolb was the year before me. Um, Webster comes in later. Ray Mansfield was a really good center. Jim Clack at right guard, then Jerry Mullins from USC at right guard, and Clack went guard. And Interesting center. that you're started, it starts with that offensive yeah. line. Yeah, and then we got Swan, Hall of Fame, Stallworth, Hall of Fame. Now we had weapons, and then, of course, we drafted Franco. And so when we started our run in the fourth year, maybe, and then we got into the, uh, to the, to the playoffs for the first time, and Got to experience that. And yeah, that let's was... not downplay. You guys go 11-3, and 3, 1972, and it leads to this, this first of this great rivalry with the Oakland Raiders. Man, yeah. that's, that's about as tough and as nasty and as good. Because they were like us. You guys were built similarly. Yeah, they were built on defense and explosive offense. And... Um, we were built on defense and explosive offense, and both ran the football. Ran the football, run the football, run the football, bombs away. When you're in a spot like that, and it's fourth down, and the game's on the line, and here's your chance in a playoff game, finally you're in a playoff game, are you feeling all that? Are you feeling that pressure? Mm, no, not really. You, you turn it loose, you go down, you hear the crowd. There's controversy with that play. I right. personally don't see it. I mean, it looks to me like Franco definitely secures the ball before it's if on If we the were turret. doing high-def cameras today and we had how many tape machines? Uh, 12, 14, uh, yeah. 16? Coverage is unbelievable. Uh, they would have had that, and they would have broken that thing down cell by cell. And, right. And then they would have made a decision on it, but they couldn't back then. There could be questions more with Franco catching it because he had terrible hands. So I would have more trouble. I'd have more trouble with Franco. God. I would tell Franco. Just a little <laughs> dig in there. No. <laughs> no. But, yeah, the, so, you know. We, no, we, the dig's at Oakland. Okay. The dig's at Oakland. So let me ask you this. 1972 is known for that play, but for the season it's known for the Miami Dolphins, right? They go undefeated and win that game in the Super Bowl. And in 1974, there's a preseason strike, and you take part in that. Yep. And, Noel, when you come back, your job's gone. I was asked to cross the line. I told him no. And uh, Joe crossed the line and played well in the preseason game and got the starting job. After the Oakland game, they benched him in favor of me. Then I, I maybe played good a couple of games, and they benched me. Then they went with Hanratty. Then back to me. Then the Hanratty. It was a mess. Um, and it wasn't just Noel. The city was against you, it felt like, didn't it? Probably. I, you know, Joe, I hate to even say anything. I'm, I'm Let's be fair. If I've you say everything. Right. Off. And if you say anything, then it comes off as, you know, you're picking on the city of Pittsburgh. I, and why won't he let that die? We're I'm, talking about my. I'm asking you. Yes, I understand that. <clears throat> yeah, they didn't like me. That. That was made clear. And they didn't like me because I wasn't what? Performing. I, I, I understand that. Um, I didn't feel like I had support with Coach Noel. And um, too many things were said privately. Um, and I didn't feel like, I, I didn't feel like ever that I was his quarterback. I just, I didn't understand um, him. And I'm, I'm sure I frustrated him because he expected more. And I, I would think to my, I thought to myself one time, why is the hell, if he's so fed up with me, why, did, why in the hell did he draft me? I mean, you know, draft somebody else, you weren't going to break my heart. You know, I thought I was going to the Saints anyway. So 
I would have been just as happy in Atlanta or Dallas or New Orleans, <laughs> any place. But I just didn't feel like I could ever make this guy happy. He was uh, a coach that I thought was more concerned about his defense than his offense because, God, how plain and vanilla could you get with us? And he was always on our ass. And did, was, did the defense make him happy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you had Joe Green over there and Lambert, wouldn't you be pretty happy? Yeah. And L.C. Greenwood and Dwight White and Mel Blount and all those great players. So as, as my life and my career moved on, the one thing that came out of this was maturity, but also I became extremely mean. Really? I got hateful. Yeah, I had to. I had to to survive. I couldn't. You couldn't be everybody. I couldn't friend. be this. I couldn't be this. So if I met you in 1970. Different guy. Yeah, totally different. I cannot picture you mean. I got mean. I didn't get mean to people. I got mean and hateful on the inside to, to put up an ironclad wall that nobody was going to get through and hurt me again. And basically, I would tell anybody, you know, you know what, you can kiss, right? <laughs> kiss it. You know? Yeah. yeah. Here, get you some of this. <laughs> that, I'm not proud of that, <laughs> but I've never been like that. They were trying to get me to hold the ball and throw it a different way. Are you kidding me? This is the NFL. So it was So the finger was on the bizarre. tip of the ball, oh, that was, they were oh. trying to take that Joe, why are you digging all this up? I mean, I just, <laughs> I spent a lot of money in therapy getting over some of this. I mean, there's a. In 74, we talked about how you got benched at the beginning. You're in this carousel, and eventually you end up on the horse at the end. Thank God. Yeah. So you're there in your home state in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 9, 1974. Yep. I can't imagine the pressure on you going into that Super Bowl. Did you, did you let that eat at you, considering all that had happened just within that year alone? No. Um, I was – my greatest fear is that most folks in this studio – and you or anybody that competes, I think, is losing. My wife says that I play not to lose. My greatest fear was losing the Super Bowl. I did not want to be a part of losing a Super Bowl. I never, I had just, ne now listen to this. I had just soon never been in a Super Bowl and lost. I did not want that hanging on my resume. That's just me. And so my fear was losing to Minnesota, and they were good. Well, Larry Brown, the tight end. So what did that feel like? I mean, Great. Oh, it was great. We saw the touchdown pass, and, yeah. and, and that was probably your, I guess what you've told us, you're trying not to lose the game. Do you feel any validation? Joe, I would have felt validation. I would have really felt good about myself had I started the whole season and, and been – responsible for the victories that we had and been consistent, but I wasn't. I wasn't. And so um, I'm sure I felt good about myself um, and proud of what we accomplished, but, but I would go in this deep depression, which was the last two, three weeks, and just miserable. And, and the whole time thinking, oh, i got to do it again. Got to do it again. Got to do this again. See, I would have thought you oh. were saying you were in a depression because it was gone and you, you were kind of looking for the next thing to do, but your depression was because now you got to build it all back up again. Oh, God, we're going to have to do this again. When 75 rolled around, now you've won a Super Bowl. Now Noel is at least willing to commit to you as the quarterback? Starting off the following year, yes. But I knew if I didn't play well. I knew if I didn't play well, I was on the bench. In 75, you guys faced the Raiders again. How vicious was that stuff on the field? And I say that because the rules have changed so much, not just for the receivers, but for the quarterbacks. Right. I mean, they were taking your head off. Right. Lynn Swan was getting clotheslined. Oh, it, poor I mean, Lynn. they went after him. Yep. It was nasty. It was brutal. It was the way football should be played. <laughs> Seriously. Beat those guys up. Body slam you. Grab the quarterback. Sling them down. Ugh. 
head slapped. I mean, it was just like, this is great stuff, man. <laughs> and now they don't practice in pads. And, and they like to talk about their offensive, offensive line, six foot seven, 395 pound average. Yeah, right. Be dead four years when they retire. Right. <laughs> can't You're... get in shape. You can't block. You can't. I don't think you can coach without hitting. You can't hardly do any of those things. We've had the pads on. You ready? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Hitting. Hitting. That's it. The Pittsburgh Steelers again have won the American Football Conference yet. Super Bowl X, uh, the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, this, this. America's team. Huh? America's team. America's team. America's team. Yeah. Funny thing about that, that, that game, and athletes are superstitious. I say I'm not, but I, I put my clothes and so I did everything the same way. Even this suit I put on the same way. But I got a call from Puma, and they said, hey, look, if you'll wear our black shoes with the Puma logo on it, we'll give you $2,500. Stop it. How much? $2,500. Get out of here. You're going to give me $2,500 just to wear your shoes? I wore Adidas. I didn't have a contract with a shoe company. And I said, yeah, give me the money. Cash, baby. $2,500, and I put those shoes on. And when I went out to warm up, and I looked down at my feet and saw those Puma shoes, I got to tell you. You were nervous. I wasn't feeling real good right then. <laughs> I sold my soul to the devil right. for 2500 bucks. <laughs> Let's take a watch. Four and a half. Then Juan beat his man on a bomb. Bradshaw was hurt on the play. The Dallas rush got to Terry Bradshaw back at the other end of the field. Bradshaw is banged up on the play, and they're picking him up off the field. Terry Cole n nailed me right here. And my brother Craig, only, only your brother would put this. He goes... Yeah, he said, you see the end zone shot, you get hit by Cole, you go down, you pick your head up, you see it's a touchdown, then you go back. Yeah. Down. <laughs> I say, champions fight to get up. That's right. Man. But yeah, whoo, I did not get clarity till well into the night. Boy, I had a headache. What does that feel like, back to back Super Bowl champions? I mean, you. That was cool. Back to back, and one of only three teams to do that was definitely something that I took a great deal of pride in. 78, 1978, the rules change. Mm -hmm. And you talked about this before. I mean, this, your defense was as much a reason why the rules changed. Mel Blunt rule. Yeah. Mel was our Hall of Fame right corner, 6'4", about 2'8". Can run like the wind. And when he put his hands on a receiver, they couldn't get away from him. And Tex Schramm in Dallas, it's my understanding, was extremely upset because his people couldn't separate themselves. And he complained to the league and went up and got the boat, got the boat in and changed it. Changed the rules for right. what you could do to receivers. Changed the rules for offensive linemen. Could use right. their hands more. Right. So what it was, really, was the installation of rules to add offense to the game. Right. And that year is your MVP year. Right. 1978. Right. I right. mean, to me, no coincidence. But... Oh, you want to hear a joke? I threw 28 touchdown passes that year. That was the most touchdown passes thrown since the merger of the AFL-NFL. It's how the game has changed. It's I mean, changed. It's, it's the old game. AFL, Joe. And the smarts of, of all of those guys, Al Davis, came together, and they realized, let's entertain them. And the entertainment will be what, what forces our merger. And so, sure enough, NBC was doing this and doing that, and then they'd start playing, and then they, they finally were forced to merge. And that's, that's what we've gotten back to. And I'm glad we're back there because it's fun. It's entertaining football. So in 1978, these rules change. You have this MVP year, right. and you end up in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 13. So before that game, Hollywood Henderson says, he's so dumb, he couldn't spell cat if you spotted him the C and the T. I have, Which I could, and we all know that. Yes. <laughs> you are about as dumb as a fox. You are, you are the least dumb guy. I don't know what the definition of dumb is. All I but know you're is not it. If you, can get, if you can find your way home from wherever you are, you're not dumb. Right. <laughs> and, 
But that that when that, he said that, oh, did it did it did it piss oh, you off? Burnt my butt. <laughs> yes, I was steaming. I couldn't let him know he got to me, but it really. I'm just this like this was on the cover this, of Newsweek when because, this happened. Yes, it was. The stigma around me was that I was not smart. I was stupid. I was dumb. Therefore, even in people that try to praise me nowadays, still say a guy who had to overcome being dumb. And I, and so I. I, I mean, want, my God, what an I awful want to thing come to say. my defense. And one of the problems I had in Pittsburgh was, please, will some of my players tell? You know, tell everybody, tell these guys. I call my own plays. I set up the offense. I set up the formations. You know, I run that huddle. That's my huddle. When I need answers, I ask questions. You guys got any ideas here? I'm having a little trouble. <laughs> you know, that, that was my huddle. That's how I ran it. This is where not going to LSU and flunking the ACT test really stands out. This is really so solidified. Oh, well, he's not any good. And... So you want to defend yourself. You want to say, hey, how dare you say that about me? Because you know what's going to happen, Joe? i got to go to Miami, and now I've got to deal with this. You know, i got to deal with this cat thing. Right. So you had I've to get consciously back. My whole Right. In big games, my whole mantra, mantra was simply to go back, go down inside, find my peace, and know there's good and bad going to happen. And so... I, during a game, I was, uh, I, I just, I never got high. I never screamed and hollered at players. I never once raised my voice to a player. I wasn't a rah-rah guy. I wasn't necessarily, a, I never was captain. Never was captain. I just kept my mouth shut. If I'm under control and I make a mistake, it won't bother me. If I'm out of control and my emotions, are getting, it'll have an effect on me and I'll make another mistake. I learned that in my career. I learned that much about me. I think, I think if you study human psychology more than you study defensive plays, I think you become a better player because you are going to be tested emotionally. And I found that I could not perform unless I went to a place where nobody could get to me. Bradshaw is back, and he's going to Swan, and Swan makes a circus catch in the end zone. Unbelievable catch. Holy smokes. The 1978 season is over. Super Bowl 13, captured by the Pittsburgh Steelers. The first team in the history of the NFL to win it three times. So you go in answering questions about your intelligence, and you come out the MVP of the Super Bowl. Right. How good's that? My only smart-ass remark after was, you know, you know, How's my spelling now? <laughs> what are you going to say? I didn't even want to say that. I didn't have to because everybody else would say it for me. You know why? Because he has this, this quote on the wall. The only way to shut everybody up is to win. That pretty much does it. That's, what are they going to say? That's all you hear. You got to win. You got to win. So obviously, winning pretty much shuts them up. The next year you're back in. <laughs> <laughs> and you're taking on the Rams basically in their backyard exactly. in Los Angeles. Right. Now, going into that Super Bowl, the guy in charge of the Rams' defense is Bud Carson, Bud Carson. who had been with you in Pittsburgh. Well, and I know years. it worried the hell out of you. Throw me nuts. Bud Carson was going to know everything you were going to do before you did it. The plays, the checks, the everything. This is a nightmare. How in the world? Are we going to beat these guys? Now, we should beat them. But I got I, I to gotta come up with something. It got in my head. It, 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 it seriously got into my head. I, I thought, this is the one Super Bowl we're going to lose. And it's going to be because of me. Because I was scared to death. They, I just knew they knew everything all the reads, all the, and he knew me. He knew I liked to throw it deep. He knew I wanted to throw wide flares. He knew I wasn't going to throw a five-yard hook or a quick slant unless it was at the goal line or something. He knew I was going to throw it deep. That's what I liked to do. Took everything away. I had three interceptions in that game. I was totally. You're losing at halftime. Bud Carson's in your head. Yeah. This whole situation. I couldn't get anything going. 
We couldn't run. We couldn't throw. I came out in the second. I came out in the third quarter. Right, that's good. But our defense wasn't as dominant in Super Bowl 14 as it had been in 9 and 10. And the Rams under Vince Veragamo, who looked like Joe Namath, were just, they were marching down. The they field came right it, back. back. Yeah, came right back. So here's the beauty of football and sports. For the entire week, you haven't hit a specific deep ball to Stallworth. Timeouts call. I go over to the sideline. Chuck says, Chuck, this is where Chuck tells the camera guy to get away. And he says, look, we're not going to beat these guys. So when, you know, medium passes, running the football, we're going to have to go deep. He said, let's, let's run 70 slot hook and go. I said, coach. I hadn't completed that pass all week. He said, no, you'll, you'll, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. So I went into the, I'm like, oh, boy, I ain't completed this all week, and here it is, and it's third down. It's a Super Bowl. Super Bowl, the plans are going crazy. And Rose Bowl, which is a cool place to play, by the way, biggest crowd I ever played in front of. And so I'm in the huddle. I'm going, okay, we're going to go open right, 70 slot, hook and go. And I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> what did Stallworth give you a look? Stallworth, like, I don't know. I don't think anybody gave me a look. It's pretty. Cru it's a. This is a pretty crucial play and a very critical. I mean, the cr critical situation. But now, when it counts the most, Super Bowl 14. Here's what happened. And Brad, four-time champions. That throw was brilliant. Oh, how good was that? Oh. Perry, what? Quarter of an inch okay. from knocking it down. The catch. The catch was amazing because the hand swipe could have taken most receivers probably would have dropped it because it was that close to being knocked down, so close. Come in number one overall in 1970 and out you go in 1983. Right. Chuck Knoll says, well, just better go ahead and get on with your life's work. Oh, I got hurt. You got hurt. Right. And that was it. That was it. And you were booed on your way out. Well, my last game was against uh, San Diego Chargers. And I threw an interception going in for the winning touchdown from about the 12-yard line. So I don't blame him. I'd have booed, too. Isn't it a shame, though, that you were so good that you didn't enjoy it? You weren't able to. I, hate, I hated it. I told this guy the other day, I, this is the last and only time, first, last, and only time I'm going to talk about Chuck Knoll. Period. And here I am doing it again. <laughs> Because he's a great coach. It's just that he wasn't my kind of coach and he wasn't my kind of guy, okay? And I wasn't his kind of guy and I was damn sure it wasn't his kind of quarterback. But he, I was the best he had and that's the way it was. And we won together. We understood one another. And it's fine. We won four Super Bowls. I did my job. I went home. Get off my ass. It's okay, you know? And then when I got... Out of the NFL, and then I was free. And I said, Thank I told my mother one, ah, oh, God, this feels so good. Now I can be myself. First ballot Hall of Famer, man. Yeah. That's, that's, cool. that's, that's something. Was it the respect, though, that you, you finally got that you deserved? Well, I, I knew that I deserved it, but at that point, it didn't matter. I, I was proud of my career. I'm glad I went through what I went through. I'm glad I had the hard times. It made me tough. As I told you, it made me mean-spirited on the inside. I found that I found my, you know, gin spot, the place I could go and be comfortable. Uh, and I understood that you get nothing without the help of people. And once talent is around you, your talent will explode. And, and uh, you appreciate what you've accomplished because you did it with other people. And that's the wonderful thing about it. So when it was all said and done for me, I was a total peace. And then into the booth. Into the booth. I mean, you know, knowing you now, it's kind of like this is what you were meant to do. You're such an entertainer. <laughs> and, and you know the game. What's next for you? I've had a lot of uh, exciting things happen to me because of football. I've been able to do movies, meet some of the greatest stars in Hollywood, I've had a chance to record. I've had a chance to perform with uh, Glenn Campbell, Marty Robbins. I have a one-man Vegas show that I do. 
I've had championship quarter horses, and my wife and I, we show and compete with my daughter, and all three of us. And we I was just going to say, nothing, though, makes you more proud than being a dad. I love it. All of them love to fish, which I love to do, so it's, it's pretty good. And I got a great wife. Finally, finally, I finally hit a home run. <laughs> yeah. Ah! We end with fun questions. I, I've seen this. I know what's coming. Would you rather shout all the time or whisper all the time? Oh, I'd rather whisper. Really? I thought you'd go the other way. Nah, I'd, I'd rather whisper. I'm tired right now from talking too loud. <laughs> would I'm you... excited today, but I would, rather just, I would rather talk normal. I'd rather whisper. Would you rather know what your pets think of you or never hear them speak? I would rather... I would rather have, I would rather them speak. You would? Yeah. You'd like to know. You'd yeah. like One-Eyed Jack, the, the, chicken. the chicken, to tell you what exactly. he thinks of you. Yes, I would. <laughs> if you could. If he could. Now, I'm taking, this in the, in the, I'm taking this as though through their expressions, not that they can talk English. No, they're going to talk English. Oh, talk English. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know what they're going to say? I love you. <laughs> Who doesn't like to hear that? I know. I love you. Would you rather have one life that lasts 1,000 years or 10 lives that are 100 years each? 10 lives. 100 years. Because I've said a 1,000 times to my wife, when I experience new places and I go, oh, this is so gorgeous. Wouldn't it be nice to know that we live 200 years where we can move here for 25 years? And then move. Have you ever been to Hawaii? We got a place in Hawaii. It's like, I never get tired of it. Every time I see it, it's like, God, isn't this great? Why did, why did we just get a place? Why haven't we done this before? I got very few years left. Would you rather have your flight delayed for 16 hours or lose your luggage? I... <laughs> well, I fly my own plane. So I don't have that problem, Joe. So. Show off. You do not. <laughs> Your dad taught you to not lie. <laughs> Absolutely, luggage. I think everybody would agree. Luggage, are you kidding me? I checked this in four hours early, and, I'll, and maybe you'll get it three or four days later. Okay. Luggage. Being late, eh, you know what? Being late, being, yeah. Who hadn't experienced that, but that luggage thing? But I do have my own plane. <laughs> I think you will agree with me that the man who sits here is, well, that smile says it all. He's a wonderful human being, one of the greatest quarterbacks ever to play in the NFL, four-time Super Bowl champion, first ballot Hall of Famer, a wonderful son, a great dad, a great brother, and a great friend. Terry Bradshaw. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you, Sunday.